Thank you, Stephen. Um, that's a really nice and flattering introduction. Um, in fact, it's possibly too flattering. I think if I'm 20% as, uh, as good as Stephen suggested, then I'll be happy. Um, that seems like a reasonable aim, doesn't it? Um, I'm going to read um, just through the book so you can sort of read along. Be a bit like karaoke. Um, Something like that. Um, I don't know if that makes it you're more likely to buy the pamphlet or if it just renders it redundant. <laughs> so whether there's a hard sell or a, or a, sh a shooting in the foot. Um, anyway, um, this first poem is called Happiness. Um, and it, I think it's, it was published in The Moth, um, which is a magazine. Happiness. Yesterday it appeared to me in the form of two purple elastic bands around a bunch of asparagus which is a very small happiness, a garden variety, nothing like the hulking conversation cross-legged on a bed we had ten years ago, or when I, when I saw it as a thin space in a mouth that was open slightly, listening to a friend pinning them with an almost cruel accuracy, the sense of being known, making a space in their mouth that was happiness. There was the happiness of my mother as we sat on a London bus, her having travelled alone to visit her son, and she seemed more present, which might have been the luggage I was carrying for her that weighed heavy as her happiness, or was her happiness. It is rare that you see a happiness so nut-like as that which we permit my father to pass around when he is talking sentimentally, embarrassing us all. And of course, the goofy ten-gallon hats of happiness that children plant on us every time they impersonate knowledge or when I'm standing on a step breathing it in and out, staying deaf in the deadness that comes after dying, sighing like a song about it. Or privately with you, when we're watching television and everyone else can be depressed as rotten logs for all we care, because various and by degrees as it is, we know happiness because it is not always usual and does not wait to leave. Um, I was just talking to Phil about the marking season, which is about to descend upon us lecturers. Um, and I, I go nuts every year. I go, you know, I just, I, I, one, one year I had the word shim repeating in my head for, and I couldn't stop thinking it. It was terrifying. I really, I just lost it, lost my shit completely. Um, so this is a poem roughly about that, sort of. Um, also, I should say that um, between me and my brother, um, there was my, my my mum had a miscarriage and um, and we knew know, know that it was a girl and I sort of I grew up always knowing this and there's something that's happening here. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, and I, I suppose I've sort of always known that that's always been in the background, um, sort of, of growing up. So this is a sort of a strange um, intersection of those those things, marking and uh, miscarriage sister, my sister. Two summers ago, when I was going nuts, I thought my sister's ghost lived in our garden. My shoulders felt warm, and I confided. Let me say she was real then, as a tongue you can bite. Let me say I knew she was very good at hockey and fun as a tent. She painted roughly, but well. Liked boys with beards, but not sex with boys with beards. Her hands were the same size as mine. Her voice seemed unaffected by gravity, and she would often discover herself holding a table's attention. She told me her ideal man was Picasso and that her biggest regret was not putting her name firmly onto living, slipping beneath it before she was born. And I regret it, in the garden with the dead fireworks, my face going wet, everything crashed on this wall, another summer coming on. Um, sometimes your sadness is a yacht. I think this is in the yellow nib. Um, coming up soon. Sometimes your sadness is a yacht, huge, white and expensive, like an anvil dropped from heaven. How will we get on board, up there, when it hurts our necks to look? Other times it is a rock on the lawn, and matter can never be destroyed. But today, we hold it to the edge of our bed, shutting our eyes on another opened hour, and listening to our neighbours' voices, having the voices of their friends around for lunch. Um, I think I must have been at a bit of a, a low ebb, and I realise that I'm never going to have a love poem written about me because my girlfriend isn't a poet. So um, <laughs> no, I don't have any plans, and I hope she doesn't, um, not to be um, her boyfriend anymore. Um, so that's it really, isn't it? So I decided to write, <laughs> I decided to write, write a, a love poem to myself. <laughs> and um, and I, I, I thought this is an odd idea. I, I don't know if anyone else has done it. I think Dr. Jo Samuel Johnson... Um, maybe he wrote, I think he wrote some poems. 
um, the post and stuff. But there's not very many out there, partly because it's a disgusting, narcissistic <laughs> But as I said, I was feeling quite vulnerable at the time. So this is a, a love poem to myself. Your basic appetites and pale feet renew my faith in evolution. When you slide, when you slide drunk into a bath, all the palm trees in Miami burn. When I think about your nervous system, its black market of strands, tearing electrics, I feel outwardly stupid. I love you, I say, and the room rings as if the air around my skin were the rind of something citrus. Really? This is a poem called Some Gods that uh, Stephen mentioned. I have no idea that there's a, is there a potential Wallace Stevens reference. It's nice. Um, accidentally. Um, I have to give him a call. Um, <laughs> some gods. God with eagle's head and five pointed star insignia on the palms of hands. God connected to seven IV drips with fire coming out of mouth. God made of warts. God with horse's legs and head of ram, reading names from a scroll pointing to a hole in the ground. God surrounded by representatives from the animal kingdom. God surrounded by representatives from the kingdom of global finance. God with cobbler's last and washing line with human faces pegged along. God with merciful expression holding knife and fork. God as a female infant. God with stomach as gumball machine. God, a smiling coma patient between starchy cotton sheets surrounded by cards and flowers. God, banging a human skull gavel to silence a courtroom of lesser gods. God, being led into a courtroom and asked to confirm holy name. God, in fool's attire, giving, inviting you to play a game of rummy. God, as bronze medalist forcing smile on podium. God, as golden ball of light forming in your chest. God, as a feeling of intense and sudden cold. God, as a feeling of sudden loneliness. God is a cup in your house that you haven't yet recognised as God, but drink from nearly every day. <laughs> God is a dead robin. God is the eye of the dead robin. God is your barely visible reflection in the eye of a dead robin. Um, this is a poem about the... I'm a big believer in the sort of... that the, the, the reader is... A, reading is a productive um, act, or, or listening to a poem is a sort of productive act. So, well done. Keep it up. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and, and this poem's kind of like that. You, you're basically leaving gaps or creating um, a, creating a sort of invitation to, in, to a reader um, to sort of participate imaginatively in the poem. So this is a sort of poem about that, um, utilising a dead pooch to do it. A man is dragging a dead dog on a lead down the street. It makes a low register hissing sound that is constant and gives you a sense of the weight of, of the dead dog. The lead is pulled tight to a straight line is attached to a collar which is the point of the freight most forward, the dog's head having been pinned beneath its body as it moves along relatively slowly against the pavement making that hissing sound. The rearmost point of the dead dog is what you might call in this instance its bottom leg. Because the pelvis has been rotated, the dog twisted on its side so one leg is in full contact with the ground while the other is slightly elevated and wobbles. And since you already have a street in mind, and perhaps a breed of dog, a colour of lead, the kind of coat the man is wearing, why not become the man dragging a dead dog on a lead behind you? Why not try to understand this thing you are doing? How the dog came to be dead and you came to be dragging it? What this means to you and where it is that you were going? Um, I'm at the age now where um, people are having babies around me all over, well, not literally all over the Um and, and it's beginning, I've been with my girlfriend 11 years, so you know, there's odd dinner table conversations with my parents, funny little eyes looking at me. Um, my brother's now having his second child, so, um, well, his, his wife is. Um, this, is a, this is a poem about, I, I'm terrified actually of the idea, I'm terrified of that sort of sudden amount of love and the fear. Of, I'm, I'm dreadful with babies anyway, I sort of feel like I'm going to break them and drop them or do something stupid. So, and this is a kind of a paranoia poem about that. It's a poem of fear for my unborn child. When I think about pushing your pram by the pond, all the dogs off their leads, nothing between us and the dark, weedy water, I drown you. I'm sorry. I'm sorry I cannot save your soft head from the terrier whose jaws lock, but I wasn't looking the second you disappeared, leaving me hot and turning round for the man or any kind of words. And as you've grown strong enough for kites and canoes or walks to shops, again, I'm sorry. 
I'm such a dreadful future father. I'm on the curb crying. I'm a mess with your scarf. All this fear, like a fizz building in a bad grey egg, is waiting for you. All this green stick nodular love, so tense, perversely stored like a bubble in my lungs, will be here, a huge trembling hand, when you arrive. Um, we're getting there, aren't we? We're, uh, a dance of death, which is a really nice idea. It's, it's sort of the democracy of death, that from um, a, a, the Pope to a pauper, everyone gets led away. Um, and nothing really came of it. We wrote the poems and didn't really do anything with them. Um, but I, I liked writing in the voice of death, which is quite good fun. Um, so this is a kind of what happened after that when I decided to do something else. So it's Death Says. Death says, The atoms of men have already spent infinity as part of something else, and all your human fudge is the passing of a thread through the surface of the light. If you were made of thinking, then being is a breath between the slats, which is why I itch your collar when a fly taps the pane. I'm your address and the hand that delivers you through. I'm the socket love must plug itself in two. I'm the lie that runs along your ribs, the gap between the rock and the wet place you will make there for yourself. You will know my hand by the back of your own. I'm talking to you now in the voice you read with inwardly, private as the name you say to the bottom of a tall felt hat. Um, had a nice steak yesterday, and that was, um, that was a, a pleasurable experience and I'm a big sort of fan of steaks. I'm a sort of um, I, I meat in general, I'm very carnivorous, so um, I couldn't possibly hold down anything at the moment. It's such a terrible hangover. Um, but this is a dream so this, maybe this will make me sick. Um, this is a dream steak, it's a sort of fantasy steak. Um, and it's a love poem as well. My steak will be as thick as the frown of the beast, will be a cut kind of love. When you cook it for me, try not to cook it but weigh it on a high heat until unstable. Think of it as mud dying, a pushed hand, or a question hung in itself about blood. I will unpack into my mouth cud grass, eye roll, fathom the taste of my own cow tongue. Commend me to my steak, for I am a living beak, and all my teeth are hungry. Um, this is a slightly odd poem, and I got... It was in the New Statesman, and... Um, I, I, you, you, occasionally you get people emailing you, but this one prompted three emails, all of them slightly concerned. <laughs> it's, it's a weird poem. Um, I won't say more than that, really. That people wanted to know what the hell it was about and why, why I was putting it in the world. Um, the spooks. I want to inject blood into the banana, then put it smartly in a bowl. I want someone to idly choose it, peel it, then taste the strange rust a quarter way down and spit out see blood in the lemony mulch, a sort of red spit with the tiny black seeds. I want them to check their mouth for a sauce, a cut, and by now the person they are with will be confused, blood on the lip in the footwell at the gum edges, and say, are you okay? I want them to reply, there's blood, then without even meaning to, without a logical tracing of thought, back, look back to the banana and see blood in the banana, feel the raw shock of something possibly unthought of. I want them to get to the idea that someone put the blood in the banana, <laughs> an idea drinking heat from skin but held unable to understand to fit the reasons I want this to happen. Um, troubling. Um, <laughs> this is um, a sort of lateral translation, so um, uh, from an English, it's originally a poem by um, Anna Akhmatova, or Akhmatova, I never know which way to say it, um, and so what I do is I just look at a line and then write sideways rather than trying to be accurate or something like that, it's more, um, more about just getting some sort of width to an idea rather than um, some sort of pinning a bit down. Um, and this is to death, it's uh, directed to death. It's, it's called Requiem, which is the, um, the long poem um, that, it's, that it's a translation of. And this is part eight of that poem, To Death. You are definitely coming, so why not now? Life is a frozen lamb, I'm waiting. I've turned off the lights and been dramatic, opening doors. Take any form you like. Why not come thumping great chunks off us? or cut our necks like bike locks, or creep into our bodies like a smell in the fridge, or surprise our throats like a tune from the morning radio that we'll notice we're singing the way you notice a police car pulling up the drive. I don't care how. The drains are gurgling. The sky is a reservoir of wrong-headed questions, and eyes that I love 
are losing their tournament. Um, this is a poem called William, which is um, the name of my nephew. And um, when I sort of met the child, it was quite it was a very emotional and lovely experience. Um, and but knowing that there was a child coming, it's sort of if you're if being a poet, you kind of occasionally the family starts sort of going, mm, you know what poem? No, where's the poem? So, um, so it took me ages and ages to write something. Um, so this is this is um, oh, it says at four months here. I think in, it's, it's supposed to be four days. Um, so this is it was at four, four days after he was born. Um, yeah, and um, it took me much longer than that to, to write it. William. When the lock chucks familiar, or a cat follows its name from a room, when silence is strung, or rain holds back the trees, I thought I had the lever of these. But weighing your fine melon head, your innocent daring to be, and mouth first searching, your tiny fist is allowed absolutely, and I am uncooked. I can feel my socks being on. Utter precious apple. Churchyards flatten in my heart. I've never been brilliant so scared. Thank you.